Dorothea Puente was born January 9, 1929 in San Bernardino County, California as Dorothea Helen Gray to Jesse James Gray and Trudy May. Her father, an alcoholic, picked cotton for a living. He abused her, as did her mother, who was also an alcoholic. Her father threatened numerous times to commit suicide in front of his children. Life was rough. Oftentimes, Dorothea had to scavenge for food. Her father died in 1937 of tuberculosis when she was four. Her mother lost custody of Dorothea and her siblings in 1938 and died in a motorcycle accident by the end of the year when Dorothea was just six. She was sent to an orphanage where she was sexually abused. Relief came when relatives from Fresno, California eventually took her in. Later in life, she lied about her childhood, claiming that she was one of 18 children who were born and raised in Mexico. In 1945, Dorothea married her first husband at the age of 16. He was a soldier named Fred McFall, who had just returned from the Pacific Theater of World War II. Dorothea had two daughters between 1946 and 1948. She sent one to live with relatives in Sacramento and placed the other daughter up for adoption. Her husband left her in 1948 and later died from a heart attack after she suffered a miscarriage. Times were hard during and after the war. Dorothea began forging checks to survive. In the spring of 1948, she purchased women's accessories using forged checks in Riverside. She was caught, charged, and pled guilty to two counts of forgery and sentenced to a year in jail. She served four months in jail and three years probation. Six months after her release, she left Riverside. During this time, she was impregnated by a man she barely knew and gave birth to the baby girl that she ended up giving up for adoption. In 1952, she married her second husband, a Swede named Axel Bryn Johansson in San Francisco. Axel was a merchant seaman. Dorothea created a fake persona calling herself Tia Singola Nayada and claiming to be a Muslim of Egyptian and Israeli descent. She and Axel were married for 14 years. Theirs was a violent, volatile union. Dorothea took advantage of Axel's frequent trips to sea by inviting men to their home and gambling away his money. In 1960, she was arrested for owning and operating a brothel under the guise of a bookkeeping firm in Sacramento. She was found guilty and sentenced to 90 days in the Sacramento County Jail. After she was released, she was arrested again, this time for vagrancy, and sentenced to another 90 days in jail. Dorothea descended into drinking, lying, other miscellaneous acts, and suicide attempts. Her behavior got her committed to DeWitt State Hospital. While committed, she was diagnosed as a pathological liar with an unstable personality. Her stint was brief and she emerged from the hospital worse than ever. She and Axel divorced in 1966. She continued using his name for some time after they broke up. Dorothea assumed the identity of Sharon Johansson, hiding her criminal behavior by portraying herself as a kind Christian woman. She found work as a nurse's aide, caring for the elderly and disabled in private homes. She moved on from this and became a caregiver for young women providing them with sanctuary from poverty, from poverty and abuse without charging them for room and board. In 1968, she married her third husband, Roberto Jose Puente, who was 19 years her junior. 
He was unfaithful. Their marriage was extremely toxic. They separated after 16 months with Dorothea citing domestic abuse as the main cause. She tried to serve him with divorce papers, but Roberto fled to Mexico. Their divorce wasn't finalized until 1973. They didn't leave each other alone after the divorce. They continued having a turbulent relationship. Dorothea filed a restraining order on him in 1975. She wasn't completely through with him after that either. She continued using his name for more than 20 years. Dorothea took on a three-story, 16-bedroom care home at 2100 F Street in Sacramento, California. She took in the homeless and destitute of the area. She became a pillar of the community, providing resources to alcoholics, the homeless, and the mentally ill. She held Alcoholics Anonymous meetings and helped people sign up to receive social security benefits. She also became a respected member of the Hispanic community of Sacramento by funding charities, scholarships, and radio programs. She put a lot of work into this. Dorothea underwent an image makeover by wearing vintage clothing, large granny glasses, and letting her hair turn gray. No one would suspect a little old lady of anything nefarious, would they? She even married for a fourth time to a man named Pedro Angel Montalvo. He was a physically abusive alcoholic. Pedro ended the relationship a week after their marriage. So Dorothea started spending time in local bars looking for older men who were receiving benefits. She forged their signatures in order to steal their money, but was caught and charged with 34 accounts of treasury fraud. While she was on probation, she still continued to forge signatures. In April 1982, 61-year-old Ruth Monroe, friend and business partner of Dorothea, rented a room in Dorothea's boarding house. Shortly afterwards, Ruth died from an overdose of codeine and Tylenol. When questioned by the police, Dorothea told them that Ruth had been depressed because her husband was terminally ill. The authorities believed Dorothea and Ruth the incident a suicide. A few weeks later, something else happened. 74-year-old Malcolm McKenzie accused Dorothea of drugging him and stealing his pension. On August 18, 1982, Dorothea was convicted of three charges of theft and sentenced to five years in jail. While in jail, she started corresponding with a 77-year-old retiree living in Oregon named Everson Gilmuth. They became pen pals and after Dorothea was released in 1985, after serving just three years, Everson was waiting for her in a red 1984 pickup. They were in a full-fledged relationship and began making wedding plans. They opened a joint bank account and paid $600 a month in rent for the upstairs apartment at 1426 F Street in Sacramento. In November 1985, Dorothea hired a man named Ismael Flores to install wood paneling in her home. She also hired him to build a six by three by two foot box to store books and other items. She then asked Ismael to take the field seal box to a storage depot. He agreed and she assisted him. She told him to stop while they were on Garden Highway in Sutter County and dump the box of junk on the riverbank at an unofficial household junk dumping site. She paid Ismael an $800 bonus and gifted him with a red 1980 Ford pickup truck, the exact same model and year of Everson's car. She told Ismael that the truck belonged to her boyfriend who gave it to her. She thought that would be the end of it, but she was mistaken. On January 1st, 1986, a fisherman spotted the suspicious-looking coffin-like box near the river and called the police. When the police arrived on the scene, 
They opened the box and found the decomposed remains of an elderly man who would not be identified as Everson Gilmer for another three years. During this time, Dorothy, Dorothea collected Everson's pension and forged letters to his family, explaining that the reason he had not contacted them was because he was ill. While this was going on, Dorothea continued to house elderly and disabled tenants in her boarding house. She took in 40 new tenants. Most of them were alcoholics and drug addicts. She was popular with local social workers because she accepted referrals of the tough cases. She was making good money from this. Still, it wasn't enough for her. She began to cruise the bars looking for new customers. Each month, she collected all the tenants' mail before they could touch it, pocketing the rest for her expenses while only giving her tenants a small amount of their own money. She had a nice little scam going. Her tenants would spend what little money they had at the nearest bar and were picked up by police and jailed for 30 days following anonymous tips. Dorothea then pocketed the rest of her tennis money after her tennis little trip to jail. In the interim, parole agents visited Dorothea at least 15 times, though she had been ordered to keep away from the elderly and refrain from handling government checks. No violations were ever noted. Neighbors began to grow suspicious of Dorothea when she stated that she adopted a homeless alcoholic man named Chief to serve as a handyman and they noticed the odd activities Dorothea put him up to. She had him dig in the basement and remove soil and garbage from the property. She then had Chief take down a garage in the backyard and install a fresh concrete slab there as well before he disappeared. In November 1988, another tenant in Dorothea's house, Alvaro Montoya, went missing. He was a developmentally disabled schizophrenic. His social worker reported him missing after he failed to show up to meetings. Dorothea had told the social worker that Alvaro had run off to Mexico. The social worker was unconvinced and filed a missing persons report. The police were called and sent out to Dorothea's boarding house. An officer stopped by the boarding house and interviewed Dorothea and another tenant while in Dorothea's presence. The tenant seemed to corroborate Dorothea's story until he passed a note to the officer, which claimed that Dorothea was forcing him to lie. The tenant said that another boarder had seemingly vanished and that Dorothea had hired prisoners on furlough to dig holes in her backyard. Police returned to the home and searched the property and discovered the recently disturbed soil in the yard. They uncovered the body of tenants of tenant 78 year old Leona Carpenter. Seven bodies were eventually found on the property. When the investigation first began, Dorothea was not considered a suspect. She was allowed to leave the property to buy a cup of coffee at a nearby hotel. After buying the coffee, she fled to Los Angeles. She was found four days later after she visited a bar and began to talk to an elderly man. She only became interested in him after finding out he was receiving disability checks. The man recognized her from the news and contacted the local law enforcement department who then quickly arrested her. She was charged with a total of nine murders. Her boyfriend, Everson Gilmer, 77, and eight tenants who lived at the boarding house. Ruth Monroe, 61, Leona Carpenter, 78, Alvaro Bert Alboto Gonzalez Montoya, 51, Dorothy Miller, 64, Benjamin Fink, 55, James Gallup, 62, Vera Faye Martin, 64, and Betty Palmer, 78. Dorothea professed innocence. Investigators asserted that Dorothea had drugged most of her victims until they overdosed. Then she wrapped them in bed sheets and placed in plastic linen lining before dragging, dra dragging them to open pits in the backyard for burial. 
The trial was moved to a Monterey County after Dorothea's lawyers, Kevin Climo and Peter Vlauten, were granted a change of venue. The trial began in October 1992 and ended a year later. Over 130 witnesses were called. The prosecutor, John O'Mara, was the homicide supervisor in the Sacramento County District Attorney's Office. He argued that Dorothea used sleeping pills to put her tenants to sleep, then suffocated them and hired convicts to dig the holes in her yard. Dorothea was accused of taking $87,000 and spent it on a facelift, among other things. The boarding house was Victorian styled, where she took in shadow people, also known as the elderly, alcoholics, as well as disabled. She overdosed her victims and then collected their government checks. Detective John Cabrera was one of the main officers to work on the case. He expressed that she appeared as a loving grandmother who took care of her community. Social services, organizations, and humanity leaders looked at her and respected her for what they believed she was doing in her neighborhood and community. She would reach out to people who needed help and provided a home and care. She continued to conduct herself in that manner and no one suspected anything. She extended her arms to everybody in a loving way, but in reality, she was killing them. She had a black heart. She took in people that were hard to place. A lot of the board and care house, houses didn't want to have to deal with these issues, like alcoholic problems. So she took them in and made it known to the, those agencies. That's the type of people she was willing to take in. And of course, that was great for everyone. She was taking in people with little to no families who were on social security or some other type of income. So people didn't come by and ask what happened to those individuals when they went missing. Cabrera was stunned to discover so many bodies on the property. He had no idea what they were going to find. They kept digging and the bodies kept coming up. The seventh victim was only a few feet away from the sidewalk. It was shocking how she could fit seven bodies in such a small yard without ever having a witness see what she was doing. Dorothea denied killing the victims, insisting they died of natural causes. The Los Angeles Times reported that she didn't report the deaths because she was afraid of violating her parole by running a boarding house that specifically catered to the elderly. Some people didn't believe that such a sweet, loving old lady could have committed such evil crimes. She looked so innocent. Investigators who found the bodies disagree. One tenant, Betty Palmer, was found buried in the backyard without her head, hands, and feet. Vera Faye Martin was believed to have been buried alive. Patterns in the dirt around her body implied that she may have been attempting to claw her way out of the shallow grave. Her watch was reportedly still ticking when her body was discovered. With so much evidence to study, the jury had quite a task on their hands. They deliberated over a month and eventually found Dorothea guilty of three murders. They were deadlocked 11 to 1 for conviction on all counts. The lone holdout finally agreed to a conviction of two first-degree murder counts, including special circumstances and one second-degree murder count. The defense called several witnesses who described Dorothea as having a generous and caring side to her. One such witness was her long-lost daughter, who testified how Dorothea had helped them in their youth and guided them to successful careers. Mental health experts testified that Dorothea's abusive upbringing motivated her to help the less fortunate. At the same time, they acknowledged that she had an evil side that was brought on by the stress of caring for her needy tenants. The jury could not agree on the other six murders. They were deadlocked seven to five. Judge Michael J. Verga declared the trial a mistrial when the jury said further deliberations would not change their minds. Dorothea received life without the possibility of parole. She was incarcerated at Central California Women's Facility in Chowchilla, California. Up until her death, she maintained her innocence 
admitting to cash in the checks, but insisting that all of her daughters died of natural causes. Dorothea Puente died in prison on March 27th, 2011 from natural causes. She was 82. All of this is alleged. Thanks for watching.